Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Monroe Live. Um, I'm Kevin, and behind me we have the 2025 um, Santa Fe Hybrid in a nice uh, earthy brass color. So uh, there is also a, uh, I believe overseas, a PHEV version. This is not a PHEV. Um, this is kind of normal, just FHEV um, vehicle itself. So, uh, you know, much smaller battery, a small traction motor, you know, in the, the overall ICE um, powertrain itself, it's packaged within. But, you know, in our kind of typical fashion, we'll go uh, front to rear and kind of talk through it. So um, it's weird on Monroe to see an exhaust system. Um, it's been a long time, at least for me. But um, when you kind of look underneath this, we'll kind of start with the normal, um, normal aspects that we kind of talk through. So you see the leading edge of uh, an extruded aluminum bumper beam. So running cross car with a, you know, expanded polypropylene energy absorber with aluminum crush cans bolted to the front of the body itself. And then um, it looks to be like a relatively large, um, I'm not sure if it's over molded, but um, like front end module, cooling module carrier itself. And you can see the size here. So it's all injection molded running up to bottom, probably encapsulating um, you know, most of the cooling module itself. Probably piggybacking from what I can see, it's, it's a hard, it's hard to see for sure but uh, probably being decked from the uh, front of the vehicle, being brought on with the, the bumper beams themselves. Um, so front cradle, so a large full perimeter cradle, um, all steel. Um, I don't see, aside from these um, cradle stanchions themselves, which are like a tube and tube sleeve design, pretty much everything is uh, stamped and clamshell together. These are, you know, kind of floating, so to speak. They can kind of shift around as they're welded to sing up and make sure they're um, the Z height is all is all set up and square with the, the vehicle itself. It'd be interesting to see. Um, I did like a brief check online to see what I could find about the PHEV or anything about this, you know, um, online. There's not a lot of pictures, but when you look here, um, so obviously this is the, the, the front leading edge of the, the, the perimeter cradle. It's going straight up into the, the motor bay, it's bay rail itself. The motor bay rails are splayed outward um, for, you know, uh, Sorb, and this is something that you know we've seen over the years. Uh, Hyundai and Kia have to essentially start to adopt some more um, offensive, uh, small overlap, rigid uh, barrier countermeasures. And then you have this little kind of outrigger here. Be interesting to see if if this is tailored to this vehicle because of width, because Sorb is based off of 25% overall width of the outer wheel flange of the vehicle, uh, not the mirrors. So. You know, you do have this large integrated structure here, and then as they may be changing wheel, or excuse me, um, you know, track with the vehicles, they may be doing kind of like a modular approach to this, or this is just something that's being added for, specifically for this market, and then maybe this strategy is being carried globally, um, you know, across other markets as well. You know, we oftentimes see, um, like on the new Toyotas, uh, for instance, you know, bolt-on countermeasures for, for SORB when they come to North America. Um, themselves. So we'll kind of get right into the, the powertrain itself. So this is a, I believe a 1.6 liter turbo. Um, you can see here some of the high voltage components bringing in uh, the current for the, the MGU itself, with the, which is inside the vehicle. So we have ice on this side, oil pan, transmission on this side. Um, I don't see any other high voltage pickups from here. Um, it's actually a pretty big motor. I believe it's a uh, 40, 45 kilowatts um, and then a relatively small traction battery being 1.5 kilowatt hours so like if you were to look at like a, an f-150 power boost i want to say their motor drive unit is like somewhere in the 35 kilowatt range uh paired with a 10-speed transmission big difference between the mechanical advantage of the transmissions and the drive line but a, a similar overall battery size as well uh being a roughly a one kilowatt battery um, for the ford as well so as we kind of come through here, you'll see, you know, again, steel clamshells, reinforcements, weld through um, to pick up your lower control arms. Those are also clamshell. On our um, EV9, we saw um, a lot more aluminum used throughout most of the chassis components themselves. That was a virtual ball uh, McPherson setup. This is a very traditional uh, McPherson setup, uh, setup as well with some bolt-in and serviceable ball joints. Let's see here. Most of what I see from like the motor bay rails and the front end structure looks very, very similar to their the EV versions. But like essentially, as soon as you get to this threshold, it all changes. Um, as this structure would come down the rail coming underneath the floorboard on the EVs, they just kick immediately out to uh, the rocker panel. And there's essentially no torque box structure. 
Um, you know, there's similar decking um, interfaces here with the body. That's pretty much all this is uh, for to align the essentially the decking of the powertrain to the body. There are similar provisions on the EVs, but all the structure you're seeing here is gone. But what one thing we do see that's kind of common between these is on the EVs, essentially, uh, I'm not going to say that this plane is the same between them. I believe it's actually um, notably higher. Uh, but Kia does like to do on um, the underside of their ICE vehicles, kind of this, this lattice structure going back and forth. Um, but on the EVs, it's all on the top. So it piggybacks off of all the, um, the seat structure and, and kind of facilitates a lot of that mounting on the EV9 specifically. On their ICE vehicles, they probably are complementing their you know, main uh, motor bay rail as it kind of comes underneath to the, like the sled runner and running rearward in car. But there's probably not much more cross car strategy or structure aside from probably one large cross member that runs across where the front seats are, um, which helps a lot for you know side impact. We'll kind of look forward from the rear. So again, um, this is a fixed. Um, oh, actually, it might be. It still looks fixed. Yeah, I don't see a bushing in there. Oh, it might be. It might be isolated. Um, but we do kind of have a double shear bracket here, you know, in. Um, like PIA or part and assembly, you know, markings. We do typically see, like, I don't know where this is in their launch cycle, but there's not a lot of quality check marks. You have some on their high voltage connections. That makes sense. A ton here on this ball joint makes me wonder if they had a, an issue and they're, they're checking it three times. Um, we obviously on the Rivians, we saw a lot of this on the early vehicles as well, where clearly people were going through and going through and checking welds and, and different assembly points. Not uncommon on, you know, like early jobs for build, vehicle builds, but um, that particular stands out in comparison when you look at the whole vehicle, there's not a lot of quality marks or check marks throughout everything. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's lots of things like positive assurance connectors and things of that nature that gets you out of doing physicalized checks and having someone go through and checking it. So what we can see from the backside here um, of the kind of motor generator unit is the exhaust, the turbocharger is up here. So it is cool in the front, hot in the back. So they're taking cool air in and then all the exhaust and everything is coming out and running out the back helps for exhaust riding. A lot of old Toyotas, things that nature would um, dump down the front and then run down. So you're essentially you're heating your whole engine bay, you know, um, as it, as it moves rearward uh, while you're driving, but this keeps everything a little bit shorter for your hot end. Um, and it helps a little bit more on the, the emission side, but we can see here, cause this is an all wheel drive vehicle, uh, the PTU, that's being bolted to the side of the transmission. So they kind of have a, a modular strategy for whether or not you're checking the box for all wheel drive or not. A card on joint here, which is very, very um, inexpensive in comparison to your kind of CV style joints. Um, let's see what else. We can see some pumps and I don't see any, um, and it's not uncommon. You can see the pass through here for the steering rack. So it is an EPS um, on, on uh, on column setup so all the motor and everything for your power steering is within the co steering column and ip assembly um a pump a lot of epdm lines you know kind of running to various spots within the um within uh the engine system like kind of apparatus uh not like a overly efficient but not uncommon right uh when you start piggybacking you know two um vehicle powertrain styles together you often end up with this just trying to package everything you need in the vehicle itself let's see what else do we see it's the egr uh cooler so here on this side kind of looking through um but uh but yeah so obviously they are bringing power to the rear of the vehicle through a prop shaft and then a conventional rear differential it does look like they do have i don't want to get too far ahead of myself though um there may be a pump or a viscous actuator so they can, you know, disengage and uh, re-engage their rear differential. Um, right here, um, you can see obviously we have the one kilo, uh, one and a half kilowatt hour battery. It looks to be, and it's not insignificant in size, the stamping. Um, I'd like to know, I imagine this is just essentially a big rectangle. It takes up the whole space and there is no complementary um, body structure that runs across there. Just um, probably at all, I can't see. If they even have like a small, uh, smaller kind of like doubler panel, but I imagine just stamped upper, stamped inner. When you kind of look at the the structure here and um, the overlapping of these straps that they have for each of the mounting points, 
the the battery is doing it's probably supporting itself as far as you know um, impact considerations from major crash events i'm a little surprised so the only thing that is covering this is essentially um a, a nut, like a, a shield it's like this you can see it here on the ground so it's just a, a a compressed pet fibrous shield um with the leading edge and again some nice features to direct the operators how to orient and install the vehicle which is nice i am just a little surprised that the high voltage um you know connectors are are, are that exposed but you know it's not a an off-road vehicle per se um where maybe the risk of impinging or, or hitting that is, is high. But the only thing that is protected is essentially a PET shield. We are seeing essentially uh, a series of, of junctions for, for cooling for the battery system itself running back along with it. And um, you get to see essentially the rest of engine systems, you know, so fuel lines coming down, vapor canister, brake lines running up to, you know, your booster and then running back down the side for your rear axle a half saddle tank because they're packaging um, the first of their exhaust tuning volumes um, here. And then it looks like just a, a single large strap that they're using um, faster here, faster here and coming up with a, like a, an isolator in between. And then a fuel tank, you know, again, something we don't get to talk too much about on Monroe, um, not seal. So they're probably just doing like a multi-layer, um, you know, build up as far as, um, like a blow molded poltrusion. Typically these are like seven, 10 layer assemblies themselves. And then it, um, but sometimes for some of these hybrids, more specifically your, your PHEVs or, or E-REVs, um, a lot of times these will be steel. They're you know, going back just because of um, use cases, especially in cities where you may not be running the ice engine and just pressure concerns. Um, let's see here from fuel filler neck. So PET wheel liners, looks like a, you know, uh, just a steel tube coming to come down here and you know your kind of old-fashioned uh, hose clamps <clears throat> coming down to the tank itself and uh, I don't see anything else kind of uh, unique from like an engine systems perspective aside from uh, most of the shielding for your exhaust system they do have some that are you know PIA or again part and assembly to the exhaust but there's a lot of body body mounted side shielding for their exhaust but they do double it up here where their half saddle tank is present the rear suspension looks you know very similar to a lot of the Hyundai Kia products to, to include um, like with its orientation and the style of links the, the EV9 that we have um, but you know, again, there, there was castings, a little bit more use of aluminum throughout the rear suspension of that vehicle. It is a little bit higher of a um, price class. And then they might also give some weight differences. There might be some, you know, ride and drive targets that they're trying to get where they, they decided to go to aluminum um, itself. But this is essentially, you know, a multi-link, um, like swim beam, uh, um, like flex beam assembly itself. They are doing mass dampeners. It'd be interesting if we ever get a P-Heaven here, whether or not mass dampeners are on that vehicle or if it's this particular trim, oftentimes, uh, depending on how a vehicle is equipped, there's some noises and then you end up adding um, uh, dampeners on select models um, within your lineup to, to counteract that. So um, if we do get a chance to look at it, we have, um, I'll try and take note of that. Um, for one of our forward links here, they're just kind of shielding it itself, probably for rock impingements and debris, because they see another one here on the leading edge, less for aero, but just essentially keep these, the leading edge of these steel control arms from getting beat up pretty hard. Um, you know, in Michigan here, we got a lot of natural roads and the rear axle of my truck, I got to recode it every year because it's just the whole leading edge of um, the axle tube just gets, you know, beat up pretty hard um, on our dirt roads here. So if, if Chris Fox was here, he would love to talk about essentially the exhaust strategy here nothing too too novel but they are using hollow tubes and then there's some welding considerations here as far as tube thickness and materials uh, but they kind of do an intermediate bracket sometimes you can get away with going straight to tube but um from a hollow tubes they're they're lighter um you, you can try to use them where you can uh, but it's it's something that the the pacific oems like to do quite a bit um it's been years since we've talked about them it's kind of funny um and then again they're doing them here with like an interfacing bracket but they're doing solid hangers, you know, on the vehicle itself. Uh, this vehicle didn't come with a, I don't believe, a spare itself. 
On some of the other Kias, they have this kind of cross structure itself and it biases one side for like a tire or a winch assembly. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting that you guys get to see here is I'm not sure what these fasteners run into, but sometimes you, you end up with a sequence or an issue where um, it's probably something on the, the interior side of the vehicle. Um, but you know, you just need to use bolts to bring certain parts of the body structure together where your buildup sequence just doesn't allow to get the access needed for two-sided spot welds. And you may not want to use, you know, other one-sided assembly uh, methods like MIG welding for whatever reason, um, based off of the stations in your, your body shop or the environmental concerns of doing MIG welding. Um, <clears throat> mostly as far as the air quality within the plant, not necessarily, you know, like a particular like carbon burden, burden of doing MIG welding. But uh, it'd be interesting to see why or what is being supported on the other side, or if this is just simply they had an access issue. Um, it could be either, uh, just something that kind of stuck out to me as you look through it. And then um, when we look at like our rear motor bay rail or engine body bay rails here, you can see a nice progression of, of materials here. So you have your crush um, interface here. Um, a lot of times we used to see tailor welded blanks uh, or laser welded blanks being used in these areas to change out material grades and, um, and, and thicknesses and um, things of that nature. But they kind of come in and out of, of popularity at times, depending on how you're getting those components. If you are laser welding them yourself in-house versus having a supplier do it. Um, so sometimes those, those parts come in favor and then sometimes for cost, they come out of favor. So it's interesting to see that they're just essentially doing a layered build of material here um, for the rear part of the rails. And then one of the things that I love, and they've been, and, and Hyundai Kia has been doing this forever. Uh, we talk about, it, I think every time too, uh, composite rear impact uh, beam itself. So integrated features to support their rear fascia. They have provisions to support wiring harness and RKE antenna as well. Still too, too many fasteners, but that's okay. I would have molded something in and then maybe one fastener if you really need it. Um, but uh, let's see here. I don't know if you can feel. Sometimes there's like a spear that they use to align this assembly. But typically it's a, like a polypropylene glass fill 45%. But um, this is something that they have been doing for years now. And uh, it's pretty interesting and depending on your, your needs, you know, as if you were an OEM, uh, it, can be a, it can be pretty advantageous to do it as well with how, how much stuff that you can get onto your beam um, and just how you can kind of manage composites a little bit easier. Typically you see these in the rear just because of the risk associated with um, rear impacts is significantly less than front impacts because, you know, your occupants are a lot farther away. So this is something that you, um, it's not uncommon to see, I don't want to say uncommon, the, the risk factor of you bring it into your vehicle program, the rear is where you'd want to start with it. Um, but they've been doing this for, gosh, five, six years at least, you know, uh, but we've seen it for, you know, year after year after year, them doing that strategy. So typically when you see certain things like that and they, um, you see it in the next vehicle generation, the next, the next, and, and, you know, Hyundai Kia has done a wide assortment essentially of, of hybrids, you know, ICE vehicles and EVs now. Um, it's something they clearly like from a, like a strategy perspective. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything big that I missed um, real quick. But, you know, overall it's, it is, um, it is similar to how they do a lot of their, their vehicles. Price class wise, it's not too bad. I think it's coming like, I think it starts at like 42 and then kind of goes up to like mid fifties, um, but not unsurprising where you see some of the, their EVs being roughly like seven to $10,000 higher, a little bit more money spent on some of the suspension components uh, as far as their use of aluminum where, um, you know, steel is very prevalent in their, their more entry level or low cost uh, variants, so. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, if there's something I missed, we'll, we'll swing back, but thank you very much for uh, you know, tuning into Mineral Live and uh, you know, we'll see you next time. Thanks.